All right. Daniel Jensen's going to be talking to us about some bug hunting in the tropics. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. This is Hunting Bugs in the Tropics. About me, my name is Daniel Jensen. I live in Auckland in New Zealand, um, and I work as a pen tester and red teamer at a company called Cyber CX. Uh, this talk is about some bugs I found while I was living in the tropics. So, there's an island called Aruba. Uh, it's a country that's a constituent of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Um, it's just north of Venezuela. There's also an enterprise networking vendor called Aruba, uh, and it was bought by HPE in 2015, and we're going to be talking about that Aruba. So a bit of background on this talk. These are um, vulnerabilities I've submitted to Aruba's bug bounty program. Um, it's a good program. They're good, easy to work with. Um, and uh, let me talk about these bugs, which is very cool of them. Um, yeah. So the, uh, I'm going to cover four uh, products that they make. So there's the AP, which is uh, like a wireless AP. There's ClearPass, which is a policy manager. Um, there's Airwave which is like network management and along those kind of lines. And then there's glass, which is a, um, like a single pane of glass that agglomerates uh, airwave data. So this is a kind of uh, terrible diagram of how they relate to each other uh, in a network and how you might find them configured, just Aruba stuff. So first thing is the AP. Um, uh, I put the least amount of time into researching this and mostly focused on post-auth attack surface. Interestingly, I actually had some bug collisions with other researchers as well, um, which they wrote up in that post, uh, the ALEF security. So a bit of technical details. Um, the APs run something called Arubos, which is a uh, operating system that they ship on it. Uh, it uses a Linux kernel. And the newer APs are most, um, mostly ARM. And some of the older ones use the MIPS architecture. That um, Arubos image is signed, and it's verified at boot. So it's actually quite, uh, quite decent compared to some other networking vendors. Um, in terms of attack surface, they have a uh, telnet server if you enable it. There's SSH. Uh, there's a web server on the instance. Um, they talk to each other using a protocol, uh, PAPI. Um, and they also, some of the newer ones, talk to Aruba Central, which is like their cloud management-based thing. So if we want to get started on researching this, what do we do? Well, just get, a, um, just get an image and extract files off it, which is easy, thankfully. Uh, Binwalk will do it happily. Um, and it's just two rounds of LZMA and uh, inside a CPIO um, archive. And you can see there, that's how to do it. There's also a bit of GPL source code on GitHub, which some uh, enterprising individual has, uh, I believe, requested from Aruba and published online, which was nice of them. So you can look at that as well. So we also want to get runtime access to the APs. Um, so the way I went about this is first find an exploit and then exploit the bug. And then I sort of set up my own um, research environment on the AP. So pull things across, like I compiled TCP dump, um, GDB server. And the easiest way to do that is using something called BuildRoot. And BuildRoot's an awesome like set of scripts that you can Basically, uh, we'll cross-compile for all sorts of different architectures. Um, and it can, you can build static libraries, uh, sorry, static binaries, so you don't have to worry about like libc compatibility or anything like that. And it's got a nice little interface. You can just go into it, tick the boxes for things you want, and it'll build that for you. So you can pull across things like TCP dump, so I can dump, uh, look at what's going on in the interfaces, and a GDB stub, so you can attach to, or like, running processes on the AP and see what's going on in them. And that's just a stub, so you can connect to the stub from the comfort of your x64 host using GDB multi-arch. And it will actually like pull the binary across the wire using the GDB protocol and all the libraries it has loaded. So that uh, makes it nice and easy. First bug is the, um, I found DHCP command injection. So I kind of found this like reading the docs for the AP and it said, um, when it sort of boots and it's not configured, it looks for an airwave. And it does this a few different ways. And one of the ways it does it is by looking for a, uh, doing a DNS lookup. And that DNS lookup uses the domain name suffix that you provide it when you hand it a DHCP lease. So in the DHCP lease, you can set uh, DHCP option 15 and put a command injection in that. And that ultimately uh, is run and gets you root access to the AP. 
So like practically, that's not, this bug's not that useful. Um, it only really works when it's not otherwise configured, so it's not something you'd probably use uh, on a job, but it's good for getting research access. Second issue I found was a command ejection. Um, so this worked in a, a somewhat convoluted way where you had a, uh, a file write into the, that directory, the EDC HTTPD custom image directory, um, and you could create a binary that had um, things like uh, backticks, so meta characters in the file name, and then when you run the show amp audit command that takes the name of the file you've written into the directory um, and inserts it unsafely into a system call. So there's a command injection there. Um, but there's a few restrictions on, on the file name. So obviously you can't have a slash because it's a file name. Uh, but there's also like some length restrictions. So it was easy enough to do backtick ID, good enough for a proof of concept. But, you know, I wouldn't get a shell out of it. So that's what the uh, decompiled code looks like that's calling system. So how do you actually get a shell in when you have quite a, a short length restriction? Well, I actually ended up coming up with this monstrosity, uh, <laughs> which there's a lot going on in there. So what's happening here is the, uh, the back ticks start off the command injection, then you use the SH, uh, which refers to the shell interpreter. IFS is the field separator, which you can use as a space, basically. Um, on Aruba OS, the dollar home environment is slash. So I set the uh, create a new variable called A, which is slash, which is how I refer to the slash, because um, the dollar home is too long. Um, and then I kind of just wildcard through some various directories. So that, after resolving the variables, looks like this. And then after you resolve the wildcards, it looks like the thing at the bottom. So it's basically referring to itself um, and will run itself. On a Linux host, this is how it looks. Uh, so you can see there's the, the contents of that file is just the ID command. And then when you sort of, uh, you know, emulate a command injection, you can see it's actually running itself. So the, the trick there is you want to look at, even if you have like restrictions on characters or, or things um, when you're trying to exploit a command injection, the environment's quite a good place to look. There's often like um, things like semicolons and on some boxes, depending on the, um, how the environment's <coughs> configured. And I also use that in another command injection vulnerability whereby they didn't let me um, do backticks or anything, and I could do a dollar and a left parentheses, which is like a subshell, but if it was followed by a right parentheses, they disallowed it. So what I did is just actually define that right parentheses as a variable before the dollar and left parentheses, and then use afterwards. Um, so yeah, check out the environment variables. It's a good place to, to source characters you may need. I'm just gonna grab a drink of water. Okay, target two, ClearPass Policy Manager. So this um, does like network access control and policy management and that sort of thing. Comes as like a um, physical hardware or a virtual appliance. That's what it looks like, oh the web interface looks like. Um, the tech stack looks like this, so it's running uh, Linux, CentOS 7, and it's got Apache, it's got Tomcat, it's got PHP, it's got Golang microservices, it's got Python microservices, there's a lot going on. Um, and you can also encrypt the disk on it, which is a, a nice feature when you, uh, when you deploy it. So getting runtime access to this, unfortunately it restricts us to a subshell, so we don't get a proper shell when I SSH to it. So this is quite common, and the way I usually deal with this is um, just boot the appliance with a live CD image, so I, I normally use gparted, and then you can um, mount the disk and then just add a new user to the, to the files in Linux that you might um, need to access, like password, shadow, sudo is that sort of thing, reboot it, and then you can log into it properly. And that, that generally works quite well when you're reversing appliances. ClearPass supports uh, disk encryption, so this uh, is how you can pull the encryption key for the disk, because when you boot it, it doesn't want to be asking you for a encryption password because people would get annoyed by that. So they have to store the encryption password for the disk. And the way they do that is they just store it um, in the init ramfs. You can pull it out like that. Here's the attack surface. Uh, that little goose there represents the attacker or me. <laughs> um, and there's a few things you can hit directly, but most of it's um, via Apache. 
So these are the Apache configs. There's a lot of them. There's, <laughs> I think, about 20 different config files they use to uh, define all sorts of ways of routing your HTTP requests to the backend applications. And on the right there are just some snippets of some of those files. So, you know, there's quite a quite a lot of um, different ways of uh, getting access to the the services. It has two Tomcat instances uh, called backend and frontend, and frontend has an application in it called tips, and that's like the main Java web application. Um, so I looked at that first. What I do is uh, look at the web XML file, um, and you can see the, uh, what the servlet mapping does is it maps like a URL pattern to a, to a servlet class, and so I just go and look at that servlet, servlet class. It also has struts, which defines other routes to, um, to other areas of the Java code. It also has something called DWR, or direct web promoting. And that's, that's quite interesting. I hadn't come across that before. And what that does is you configure, you put like a class name in the DWR XML file, and it then exposes every method inside that, um, that Java class to being called remotely. So there's quite a lot of um, attack surface there, and I think some of the vulnerabilities I found were not intended to be reachable, but because they include the whole class, there's various methods in there that can be reached. So because we um, have root access to the ClearPass, what you can do is just go and enable debug mode for direct web remoting, which gives you a nice like HTML interface, so you can just go and click around and see all the various um, methods and, and such that you can call. So the next step is to decompile the Java code. And I like using Procyon for doing that because Procyon has a flag SL or um, stretch lines. And what that does is in the output decompiled code, it will match um, the Java files. It generates lines to the line numbers in the line table and like insert new lines where, um, where they're needed. And what that buys you is the ability to do line-based debugging. Uh, which makes it easier when you're debugging an application and want to break on like a specific line. Um, and you can, you can debug applications from decompiled code, which was actually kind of a surprise to me, but it works well enough. Um, if you just load that code in, um, that you've decompiled into an IDE, and uh, I use uh, IntelliJ IDEA, and then just set up a remote um, debugger like this, and then connect to it. And that gets you all sorts of good things, like you can see this, um, the stack trace, you can see the variables um, that are at runtime. So if the uh, like static code that you're trying to read is utterly inscrutable, you can uh, <laughs> connect to it and see what's going on at runtime, which is quite helpful. Another good feature of that is you can set breakpoints on interesting syncs. So Process Builder um, runs a command in Java. So what I do here is um, set this breakpoint that dumps a stack trace and prints the command, but it doesn't actually break the application. So you can set this up um, when you're connected to the application, and then go to the app and click around it, do some stuff, and then come back and look at your logs, and you get things like this, which show um, commands that are being executed via Process Builder and where the, uh, what the stack trace uh, looked like at the time. So, first vulnerability um, is an in-map argument injection that was reachable via a path traversal. It worked like this. Uh, that's the relevant um, Apache config file. So you can see it's mounting the activity dump service alias um, via JK mount, which uh, mounts it into a, like a Tomcat worker. So any URL that uh, starts with activity dump service will be sent to backend Tomcat. Um, but you can do a traversal in there with the uh, dot dot semicolon slash trick because Apache sees that URL at the top as starting with activity dump service, whereas Tomcat actually follows that uh, traversal and will send it you to network services, which is otherwise unreachable. So I could access this without authentication. Um, and what it does is posture validation, which basically lets you like in map an arbitrary IP address. This is a snippet of the Aruba code um, that was there in there. And that looks, that looks pretty vulnerable, right? Like it's taking the host IP and just constructing a string out of it uh, and passing it to runtime get exec. 
Well, you could just command inject it, right? No, you can't because uh, runtime get runtime dot exec doesn't actually invoke a shell. It tokenizes that, and then uh, on the bottom right there, you can see the uh, the exec ve um, is not splitting that into um, the ls and id command. It's just running, trying to ls that um, file that doesn't exist. So it's not vulnerable to command uh, injection. If we see when we test it here that the um, the who am I command isn't run and it doesn't work. But it is vulnerable to argument injection. What's argument injection? I kind of explain it like command injection lets you execute arbitrary commands, whereas argument injection lets you manipulate um, the arguments to a command. And that doesn't sound super useful, but it actually it actually is quite useful. A lot of uh, binaries have useful flags you can call that do dangerous things. That GTFO bins is a good resource for it. And I also see this quite often um, where I think the devs have uh, fixed a command injection issue previously, but they haven't fixed an, an argument injection in the same area. Because fixing command injection, depending on how you do it, doesn't necessarily uh, prevent argument injection. So I think this is a really underrated bug class and definitely one to watch out for, given how often I've seen it. Anyway, we can do argument injection in that nmap call. So you can see I'm running the, the help command, but there's also, uh, sorry, the help flag, but there's also more useful flags you can use for exploitation. So obviously you can just write the, uh, the nmap output into various directories. It also has a script HTTP fetch, which is included by default, that will let you um, pull in a file from a remote host, the one you're scanning, and write it to a directory you specify. And MAP scripts are Lua, so you can execute arbitrary commands through them, like the bottom there is OS execute. So the way I exploit it is like this. The bit in blue is the directory traversal, and then the bit in red you can see at the top in the first request I'm fetching a, a script uh, from my host and storing it in the tempz folder. And then the second one I actually just specify that as a script, and that contains my shell. So it can run code like that through the argument injection. If we don't have egress, you can also get around it because on ClearPass it has the uh, guest application, which is PHP, and what you can do is just write into that directory, which is the web root, and like write a PHP shell. XSS is pretty straightforward. I'm not going to go into that in too much detail here, but basically there's a, an area that, that you could reach unauthenticated depending on the config. Uh, you could send it that post request with the XSS payload. Didn't fire in the, the main application, but in another area of the application, it did fire. So XSS is really, in my mind, an output encoding issue. Uh, so even if it's not firing in one area of the application, there are other areas. Make sure you've checked all the areas uh, to see if that same payload is, uh, user data is um, elsewhere. Okay, class loader manipulation. So a while ago, there was a, a classic struts one vulnerability, and that was um, N2. Uh, and that was down to it using this library, Apache Bean Utils, and calling populate on, uh, on a bean with user supplied data. And what that lets you do is call arbitrary getters and setters, but um, at the time, they hadn't blocked you from calling get class and get class loader, which lets you um, uh, set arbitrary values in the class loader, which can be quite useful. So ClearPass um, used to use a vulnerable, vul <coughs> excuse me, a vulnerable version of bean utils, which was vulnerable to that, and it also had an un unauthenticated HTTP endpoint uh, that let you directly pass user data to it. So when I found this, ClearPass was using Tomcat 7, and there's no publicly known proof of concept for um, turning class loader, class loader manipulation into code exec in Tomcat 7 on Linux. But you can do, uh, do other things like overriding the doc base and you can um, set an alias. And what setting an alias let you, lets you do is basically aliases like a, uh, a URL to a path on the file system. So that gives you an arbitrary read. Also, if you have the ability to upload files to, to the uh, file system, you can set the alias to that directory and uh, um, like upload a JSP shell. 
So, okay, we have an R breed. On ClearPass, it's often set up in a cluster mode. And even when it's not, it creates this file here, the cluster password dot properties, and that contains the clear text password for the cluster admin user. And that buys you a lot, because the cluster admin user is very highly privileged. Um, when I went to exploit this, I found in the Apache config that actually prevented uh, any URL <laughs> with dot properties in it, no doubt in relation to some other vulnerability, but can be simply bypassed with the semicolon. So, <laughs> what you can do once you've read the, uh, the, the cluster admin password is access the tips API. Um, and I'm, what I'm doing in the top box there is creating an admin user, which lets me log into the web interface. Uh, once I can log into the web interface, there's, there's a bunch of different ways of uploading files to it. Um, and they go into like a temp directory which normally is not a problem, but because we can set an alias, we can just uh, alias that temp directory to a reachable URL and then access our uploaded web shell, giving us code exec. Signature check bypass, um, I am going to skim over because I realized I talk too fast when I was timing this talk, um, but the details are in this, in this slide deck. So I'm just gonna go over there. Right. Here's the good one. Um, so ClearPass has like a, a, a Go binary listening on localhost um, on port 7007, and you can reach it via Apache. And what it does, the Go binary does the authentication, um, and it attempts uh, to access an X44 header and checks if that is exactly localhost or 127001. Um, if that X44 header doesn't exist, it falls back to the remote address. Um, which is always going to be localhost because you're talking to it via Apache. Um, Apache doesn't let us mess with the exported for localhost in the request headers. It's been explicitly blocked. And also, um, it would just include, even if I could set it, Apache would simply add the exported for header I sent to its own one, and then it wouldn't exactly match 127001. So what we need is like a way of removing headers. It turns out you can do that. So there's something called a hop by hop header. And what, let, what that lets you do is kind of like tell the, the server you're talking to like, hey, uh, this, this is just between me and you. Like don't, don't tell it to upstream. So <laughs> that uh, is defined in RFC 2616. And basically, yeah, it lets you remove headers from, uh, from what it's uh, saying. So an example request and response looks like this. At the top, you can see it's saying exported for um, and then down the bottom, if I add X forwarded for in the connection header, which is how the hop by hop works, um, it's actually not forwarded up, upstream. As an interesting aside, I found this vulnerability in September 2021. Um, and when I was re reproducing the vulnerability for this talk, I couldn't get it to work. And I was like, what's going on here? This is interesting. Um, so, I, so I Googled for it and whoops, turns out there was actually an Apache vulnerability uh, that I'd been accidentally sitting on for several months. <laughs> So I just uh, reported it like a month ago, I think. Yeah. Anyway, it's a uh, patch now. So but now we can reach the Go APIs binary. What can we do? Well, uh, well, what it supports is letting you pass in uh, the URL to a uh, ClearPass upgrade file. And the way ClearPass upgrade files work is when you, uh, they're basically a tar file, and within that tar file they have a, a zip um, and a signature that sits beside it. And when you get it to, to do an upgrade, it pulls that tar file, uh, extracts the contents, and then it didn't, it, if the signature doesn't match, it doesn't delete the contents, it just deletes the outer tar file, but those things are still sitting extracted on disk. So there's a few different ways of exploiting this, and what I ended up going with is uh, doing it twice. So first of all, you upload a tar file that just contains a sim link to the guest directory, which is you know, your writable web route. Um, then it deletes the tar, but leaves that sim link. And then in, in the next tar file, you do this and create a, um, a PHP shell that is in a folder with the same name as the sim link. And then when the tar uh, extracts it on the second run, it writes through the sim link and into the web directory. So you can get an arbitrary file write anywhere on disk like that. Uh, that's how the uh, requests look to exploit it. Right, next target is Airwave. So 
So Airwave um, is like a network management system. You can be, it can be a virtual appliance or physical hardware. Um, it runs a CentOS 7 again, uh, Nginx and Apache, and the main web app's written in Perl. Here's our uh, goose-based attack surface of what the Airwave looks like. Um, yeah. So the first uh, bug I'm going to talk about is an auth bypass when ClearPass is, uh, sorry, Airwave is set up to do auth via Radius. So imagine you're a Ruba and you're writing some code and you say, hmm, how do we determine if the Radius authentication attempt to this Airwave web app was successful? Should we use a reliable Perl library that supports Radius authentication? No. Should we? just shell out to a binary used for testing configs and regex the output. Yes. <laughs> so uh, this is the code that's do doing part of it. So um, it's taking the supplied username and password and creating a uh, config file for the ePoll test binary, which has the same format as um, WPA supplicant. There's a bit of uh, reasonably inscrutable Perl that, but basically what it's doing is just up sending that config file to ePoll test over standard in, and then calls the e extract ePoll output subroutine, which works like this. So what that does is um, basically just regexes the output of ePoll test and looks for the string entering state authenticated and then some other stuff, um, letting it know what the user's um, privilege levels are. So. What does the output of ePoll test actually look like? Well, it's a testing uh, binary, so it's quite verbose, and it looks like this. And crucially, uh, the username is output regardless of whether the authentication was successful or not. So, because it's just regexing for entering state authenticated, what we can do is say, hello, yes, my username is entering state authenticated, <laughs> uh, set any password, and get logged in as that user. Um, interestingly, I found some comments where the devs were very uh, close to finding this bug, but not quite. So that's, that's an auth bypass, and that's all well and good, but you know, we, we want a shell as well. Let's, let, this is some interesting code. Let's go back and look at it again. Um, so it, it does escape the quotes, um, double quotes, so you can't escape out of the, uh, the username, or can you? It turns out uh, that's not the only way of escaping a, of getting out of a config line on ePoll test. You can also inject new lines. So what that lets you do is uh, inject a new line and then you can put arbitrary config lines into this config file. Um, and given it has the same format as WPA supplicant, you, you could, I looked through it and found that it supports open SSL engines via the PKCS 11 engine path. Uh, that is accepted by most common OpenSSL commands, and the engine is basically like a, a shared library that is loaded and executed when run. So you can inject a config line that looks like this and set PKCS11 uh, engine path to a file on disk. The config en ends up looking like that after we've done the, con the new line injection. Um, and that's how you can use it to get code execution. So simply upload your engine file onto disk uh, after you've exploited the auth bypass, uh, and then run that command, and it will load and run your arbitrary code. Right, Perl to serialization. So some endpoints in Airwave um, to serialize Perl objects, which is quite interesting, and they're signed with like a per install secret. Um, and I, I hadn't really come across Perl to serialization before, but it's using a, it's using a library called Storable, and when I looked into it, there's only a few like good resources on it. Um, so I read those, and none of them really answered the question I had of like how do I how do I exploit this? Reading the docs, it specifically notes um, deserialization. If you set eval to one, deserialization is done via eval, which is dangerous. And do not accept storable docs from untrusted sources. Uh, this is the Perl code that does the uh, the deserialization. So it checks the signature, and then it uh, deserializes the object after first setting storable eval to one. So I thought, great, this should be pretty easy to exploit. I know how deserialization bugs work. You, uh, you look for things like 
like, uh, for example, in PHP, you have magic methods, and basically they're like things that get automatically run at certain stages in an object's uh, lifecycle. So the in Perl destroy is run when a like a runtime object is destroyed. And I found this file http.pm that basically uh, checks if an array key exists, and if it exists, it calls it. Uh, so, and there has to be a code ref though, which is like which is like a subroutine in Perl. So this is how you construct an exploit for it. I've just put a uh, just a basic sleep command in there and uh, freeze it. Uh, sign it with the salt, which you can uh, get. You kind of have to exploit another bug to get the salt, but there's a zero. Um, and then send it the base64 object, and you get your sleep. So the deserialize works great. So I sent that to them. Uh, then they fixed it poorly, and then I bypassed the fix, and then they uh, didn't fix it very well again. And now I don't know. It might be fixed. They stopped paying for bugs in this product, so I stopped looking. Um, Anyway, later on I was looking at the docs again and it said like, it's done via eval. I thought, do I really need to call a uh, destructor? That doesn't sound like how it works. So it turns out uh, it is actually just evaling it and what you can do is just go and hex edit your uh, like Perl, frozen Perl object and put arbitrary code in and then when you thaw that with eval on, it just gets run. So you don't actually have to go down that destructor path unless uh, eval is not set. Okay, last one, glass. So glass is like a, a single pane of glass, uh, I assume is why it's called glass. Uh, it like collates airwave data. Um, it's Kubernetes and it used to be Coros and now it's uh, Ubuntu. Um, has a lot of microservices and some very hefty memory requirements. It wanted 96 gigabytes of RAM, which was a bit much for my poor old laptop, but I managed to buy it down to 24 and get it running. The web interface just looks like that. Um, Here's the goose-based attack surface. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in there, like uh, Grafana, Elasticsearch. Uh, that's why, obviously, why it needs so much RAM. There's there's a lot of pods running on this thing. So, first thing I did is look at the nginx config, and there's there's quite a few, and that's just proxying requests to to all these different um, pods. So I thought, okay, I'll I'll, I'll try and find exploits via the web interface. So I log into the web interface. Um, literally the first thing I try has a command injection in it. Uh, so that was pretty, pretty, I, I got a bad sense when I saw that. Um, anyway, that's a, that's a post auth issue. But turns out that, uh, you see the glass at the start of the URL, turns out that's actually just like an authentication uh, layer and then that then proxies the request further on to a different pod. Um, that pod is actually also directly reachable via Nginx, so you can simply change the URL and turn it into a pre-auth bug, um, which is good. But so we have code exec as root in a pod, but I, I kind of want to escape the pod. So if you have a look at the mounts, there's a lot of read-write mounts, and these are these are running as privileged as well. Um, so the one I ended up exploiting was the EDC systemd mount. And what you can do there is actually, because that's uh, maps in the systemd directory from the, uh, from the node, uh, just create a systemd service and start it from inside the pod and you get escaped from the container you're in and a full cluster compromise uh, from a pre-auth bug. So for authentication, it uses uh, this thing called CAS, a perio CAS. Um, Originally it was running, running 4.14 and there was like a known exploit in that, which was a deserialization. Uh, so I exploited that. Um, at, at the time there was no public proof of concepts, but there is now, which I've linked there. Um, since they're public, I'll just skip over that. Then they updated it after I submitted it to uh, 4.17, so according, fixed according to the vendor. And it, it changes how it's uh, the, ob the ob deserialized uh, object um, is encrypted, and uh, they also removed the Apache Commons jars, so I couldn't use those for gadget chains anymore. But looking at the uh, vendor fix, they specifically highlight um, if you're using the default encryption keys, which they were, and you have not generated new keys, you must take action to re regenerate the keys. Do you think they de regenerated the keys? No, they did not. They kept those keys. So 
what that means is we can just still sign arbitrary um, Java objects using uh, this code here, if you want to do that yourself. And uh, are there more deserialization gadgets? Yes, there are. So I played a bit of gadget whack-a-mole where <laughs> I'd uh, submit them a bug and then they'd fix that but not change the keys, uh, like I suggested, and then I'd find another gadget and eventually uh, they fixed it so that the keys are randomly generated on, on boot. Right, uh, let's have a quick demo. Alt tab. Uh, okay, I have to find it now. Okay. Oh, yeah. So what I'm uh, what I'm doing here is just going to ex exploit a few of these uh, vulnerabilities I've just talked about, but it's nice to uh, nice to see them in action. So this is the um, this is the nmap argument injection. Hopefully that's uh, that font size is readable. So I just kick it off scanning my host, which is hosting the um, the n6.nse, which is the Lua script, which I'm going to uh, get the clear pass to pull in and run. Just takes a second. Uh, should see the the nmap coming soon. There we are. So now that n6.nse uh, shell uh, Lua script is sitting on disk on the clear pass. So then we execute the uh, the second argument injection, which just runs it as a script. Um, and that's going to send us a reverse shell, which should come in now. There we go. That's the, the first pre auth. Right, this, this one is the, uh, the Airwave um, username regex issue where if I try to log in with you know, just an invalid user, it, that's not going to work. But if I paste in that entering state authenticated username, it logs us in. <laughs> then I'm going to go and exploit the, um, the, uh, the OpenSSL engine issue. So I specifically pick this, uh, this firmware type because it doesn't uh, validate anything in it and I can just upload that engine, the OpenSSL engine file on disk. Uh, that's how you construct it, by the way. So now that's uploaded to disk, um, and then I'm going to go and uh, exploit it with that uh, epo config uh, newline injection and get the shell to come in now. Okay, this is the glass uh, command injection issue. So we're gonna get this, uh, we're gonna do it backwards and get the uh, systemd uh, pod breakout file and just base64 it because that's an easy way of transferring a file uh, in a, in a um, command injection and write that onto on disk in, inside the pod via the command injection. And that's, that's run, get our NCAT listening. Then we're gonna restart systemd so it can see that file and then we're just going to start the service and the shells come in and that's a full root on the uh, glass cluster. I, yeah, you can see there's a lot of containers running. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Oh. Right, uh, one second. Okay, so getting started, uh, where are we? Damn it. Okay, I'm gonna have to use this. Getting started yourself. So I showed you how to get research access to the virtual appliances via uh, like just mounting a live CD. Um, you know, but how do you get access to the hardware APs? Well, let's, if you don't want to find an exploit, let's have a look at that. So, Arubos has a support command and it specifically says, uh, do not use this command without the guidance of Aruba customer support. Yeah, but we're hackers, so I'm gonna run it anyway. And it uh, asks me for a username and then it prints out a token and gives me a URL. So okay, I'll just go to that URL. It says this tool is specifically restricted to uh, TAC, so well, I'm just try decoding it anyway. No, I'm not authorized to do that. 
Okay, got to bust out the decompiler. Um, so it turns out what it's doing is it's actually um, using elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, and uh, which which gives you key agreement over an untrusted channel. Um, so I, ha I initially reversed this support binary um, with Ghidra, and which took took me some time because uh, it was a little tricky. And then it turns out the uh, that source code was just in the GPL release on GitHub. So I guess the, the lesson there is like uh, try Googling first before you spend hours in a T compiler. Um, so the, uh, the elliptic curve they're using is, is custom. They've, they've got their own elliptic curve. Um, those are the, uh, the, the fields. Um, and they have like a fixed public key for Aruba support that's compiled into the support binary. So what's actually happening when you run that support command is it generates you a public private key pair on the hardware AP you're running. Um, and then that token is actually the X coordinate of, of your public key that it's just generated. So you give that to the support command. And then what it does is calculate the uh, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman shared secret. Um, and it then uses that to derive the support password by doing a bit of uh, like HMAC and, and that sort of thing. So that's that's like that's pretty cool. That's a lot better than some like hard coded static super user string like I have seen in some other vendors. But let's look a little bit closer at that. The comments uh, say it's a 64-bit elliptic curve. Elliptic curves are small, but they're not that small. Oh, and there's also some comments about skipping NIST validation, which uh, certainly uh, piqued my interest somewhat. Turns out you can crack that key. So a 64-bit um, elliptic curve roughly has 32 bits of security. Um, it's well within range of a desktop computer. How within range? Uh, with a good implementation about on my desktop, 200 seconds. So if we paste those constants in and break the uh, Aruba support it's public key, it takes about two minutes. So that's pretty cool. It's fast, but you know, is that fast enough? Turns out uh, with the uh, um, discrete logarithm problem, you can solve it much quicker when the order of the curve can be factored using, uh, and you do this via the polig hellman algorithm. Um, and then it kind of makes the complexity uh, the basically the largest prime factor of the order of the curve. So it's quite common for elliptic curves to use prime orders to prevent this. Did Aruba use a prime order for their curve? No, they did not. It can be factored, so the largest factor is only 40 bits. Um, so then we can break it in six seconds. And there's the private key. So what that buys you is the ability to implement the response for the challenge, challenge response script and get support access to the device, uh, which gives you a full shell on the device. Um, there's a script for doing it. It's available on the media server and I'll make it public. Um, so you can then now get research access to your own Aruba APs and a full root shell. In a presentation, thank you.